In today's lecture, we're going to look at a new idea called a, a path integral. Okay? Now, a path integral allows us to integrate over curves and uh, curves in two dimensional uh, regions and three dimensional space. Now, the integral that you've seen, for example, at school is something like this, right? Now, the region of integration there is just a straight line segment. Well, what happens if you want to integrate functions along non straight line segments? This particular region of integration here is only, I guess, in one dimension. What happens if we want to integrate in, in, in higher dimensions? Now, you've already seen things like double integrals, triple integrals. What we're going to talk about today is integrating functions in space with respect to the arc length. Okay? Okay, so for example... Suppose I have a helix and I have a function of, say, three variables that's defined on that helix, a real valued function. Right? Can I integrate that function over the, the helix? So that's one of the questions that we're going to pose and answer today. We're also going to look at applications. In the previous lecture, we looked at the applications of double integrals to calculating the mass of two-dimensional plates and things like this. Here, we're going to look at the case where, for example, this helix represents a coil or a spring, and we know the density at any point in the spring. What we would like to do is calculate the total mass of the spring. Okay, so if we're going to be integrating over curves and paths, then it would be useful to be able to mathematically describe those curves and paths. Okay, now in the first half of this course, you saw vector functions of one variable. Okay, so this function here is a vector-valued function of one variable t. Now, we say that a vector-valued function parameterizes a curve, here I've denoted it by curly c, on this interval, if the image of the vector function traces out the curve curly c. All right. So to give you a very simple example, suppose that my curve is a unit circle in the plane, xy plane. Can we parameterize that curve? Well, yeah, it's very easy. Okay, so this vector function, C of t, parameterizes the curve. Now, notice that I've put a direction. In fact, this vector function traces out the curve C in the anti-clockwise direction. However, for today's lecture, we're not going to be too worried about the direction that the curve curly C is, is swept out. In by, by the, the vector function. Okay, we're not too worried about that. When we get to so-called line integrals, it's going to become direction is going to become very important. But for our, our purpose today, 
it's not too important. All right, here's another example. Here we have a helix. And if I define the vector function C of t by cos t sine t t for t between 0 and pi, well, the vector function C of t traces out the image of the, of, of the vector function C of t traces out this bottom part of the helix. Okay? Can anyone think of another parameterization for that, that red curve, that part of the helix? There, there, there's more than one way, of course, to parameterize curves. Anyone? Well, you just reverse the direction, really. In this case, we start here, and as t increases, we go up to here. Of course, you can start here and go back the other way. It'll still trace it out. All right? The, um, the, particular, the other parameterization then would be something like minus cos t, minus sine t, minus t for uh, t between minus pi and 0. Okay? Okay. All right, now, before we actually get to what a so-called path integral is, probably a better term is curve integral, by the way, because we're integrating over curves. Um, let's actually discuss how to compute these things. So we'll, comp we'll, we'll just dis discuss the computation and then worry about the theory a little later. Now, a few assumptions. First of all, we assume that we have a parameterization for a given curve and a, a function f of three variables is continuous. C dash is a continuous vector function. This is how we define the path integral. Notice that it's written with this ds notation. Okay, now the ds means the arc length element. All right. Also notice that we have this curve C, curly C, in the integral sign. Now, we can reduce this in the computation to just an integral that we know and recognize. Okay, here the lower and upper limits of integration are from here. F is evaluated along the parameterization, C of T. And this here is the... Um, magnitude of, of the vector function c dash of t. So we multiply these two things together and integrate them. It's quite simple. Now, in first year, you would have seen how to calculate the arc length of a curve. Okay, this, you may have not used this notation, but this is actually, you, you would have seen this in first year, right? or possibly even at school. Okay, so just a little bit of notation. Here, c of t is just x of t, y of t, z of t. f of c of t is as you would expect. The magnitude is written like this. This is the way it's written in first year. All right? And, to, of course, to calculate the derivative of a vector function of one variable, you just go through and differentiate each component. In this case, with respect to t. Okay, so how do we come up with this uh, line integral? Well, you guys have seen a lot of integration now, and the, the basic technique is to slice and sum. So in two words, that's all we do here. We slice, form some Riemann sums, and then take the limit. That's all it is. Nothing fancy. Okay, so here's my curve curly C. I slice it up into sub, I guess, sub arcs. Each sub arc has arc length delta SI. What I'm going to do is choose a sample point within each of those sub arcs. 
and I'll label, uh, label the uh, ith1 p sub i. Now we consider the following Riemann sum. It's the sum of f evaluated at our sample point times the arc length of each sub-arc. Okay? So essentially what we do is we want to investigate this delta si a little bit further and try to write it in terms of um, a parameterization or something like that. All right, so essentially we would like to take the limit as n goes to infinity of this and, and form our, form our uh, line integral, uh, our, our path integral, sorry. All right. Now, you can see I've chosen a partition of, the, of this interval. We've assumed here that curly C has parameterization such that C dash is continuous. All right. Now, that C dash is continuous is going to be important here because we're going to apply the mean value theorem for integrals. Okay. All right, so let each of our sub-arcs be parameterized by CT for T on this, on this interval. Now, the arc length formula, in other words, delta SI, is this. Now, because C dash is continuous, the magnitude of C dash is also continuous, right? That means I can apply the mean value theorem for integrals to this, okay? So in other words, I can write this as this for some Ti star in, in, in the interval, okay? Okay, so now what we can do is take our sample point to be C of T i star. So now we can replace this with C T i, P i here with C of T i, and this delta S i with this expression here. All right, in the limit, we get this. All right, so there's nothing difficult about this. It's the same techniques that you already know. Slice and sum, set up your Riemann sums, and take the limit, right? But you just needed the mean value theorem here for, for integrals, all right? Okay, so let's get down to a problem. Let's actually see how you, do, how you work with this path integral. All right, so we're told here that C is the straight line segment from the origin to 1, 1. Calculate this line integral. Okay, so here's a good test. Can anybody do this problem without actually doing any integration? Anyone? Yes. Oh, yeah, perfect. Okay, so, it's a, so, so can you, it's, it's a triangle. What, what do you mean when you say it's a triangle? It's got a line going up. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, x y x y plane, right? Yeah. Yep. Oh, you're, you're perfect, perfectly right. Okay. What what I do is I'll do this in the standard way, and then we'll do it in a geometric way as well. Okay. Um, well, actually, I, no. I guess I'll just show it to you right now. Okay. X plus y. That's just in the in three dimensional space. It's a plane, right? So let's consider the plane that lies above this line segment. but below this plane, okay? There's a little picture here. Okay, you can see here, this is, this is actually a little line segment. And this line here is the part of the plane, z equals x plus y, that lies above that little line segment. So you can interpret this as the area of a fence, this is a little triangular fence, okay? So one side of this triangle. So you can easily calculate the length of the base and the length of the perpendicular height. And you come up with root 2. So 
at school you learn that the geometric interpretation of the integral is the area under a curve, right? With these path integrals, at least for functions of two variables, you can also have this interpretation. Right, but let's actually do the problem and work out how, how this all sits together. All right, the first thing we need to do is parameterize our, our path. Okay? So we need a vector function of one variable. And this one will do. Well, where did that come from? Well, it comes from the following. If you have a straight line segment between two points, you can use this, this algorithm here. So that's the starting point, that's the ending point. And they're multiplied respectively by 1 minus t and t. And the interval is always from 0 to 1. Okay, it's a good, a good formula to remember. Right. Of course, you don't have to choose that parameterization. You can choose, choose other ones as well. All right, so what do we need? We need C dash and then the magnitude of C dash. So what's C dash going to be? 1, 1. And so the magnitude of c dash is going to be root 2. Now, notice that there's no t dependency here. This is just a constant. In general, there will be t's here. Okay, this just, work, just works out quite nicely for this particular example. Okay? So now we need to evaluate f along our parameterization. So, f of c t, we go up here, and we replace x with t and y with t. So it's going to be 2t. Okay, so by definition, the line integral of f, oh, sorry, the path integral of f over c is just going to be 1, 0, times this integral here. So essentially, I'm integrating this. If I integrate that, I'll get root 2. Okay, note here I've put the upper and lower limits for this particular problem. In general, it'll just be A and B. Yes, question? C? You mean up here? Yep, so what's your question? So, okay, so good, that's a good question. If you're asked to parameterize a straight line segment, joining the points A and B, right? You would put the point A here and multiply by 1 minus T and plus T times the point B and for T between 0 and 1. That will give you a parameterization for any line segment joining two given points. Okay, you don't have to choose that parameterization. It's just, it's just nice and simple because... T equals 0, T equals 1, they're nice, nice numbers to work with. Okay? Any other questions for that example? Hmm, okay. So 
So, like I said before, for functions of two variables, you can think of the path integral as the area of a fence, one side of a fence. Okay, we demonstrated this with the triangle. Now, of course, this, this has a straight base. It's much more interesting when you have a curvy base here, right? All right, here's another example. C is part of a helix parameterized by this vector function here. Calculate the line integral, uh, uh, the scalar line integral of this uh, particular example. All right. So the nice thing here is we have our parameterization. We don't need to go out and find it. So C dash is going to be something like minus sine t cos t1, and the magnitude of C dash, what's it going to be? Anyone? Root 2, because you get cos squared plus sine squared equals 1. Again, see there's no T dependency here, although that is rare. So let's evaluate F along our parameterization. So what's that going to be? So we go down here, we replace x with cos t, y with sine t, and z with t. Okay? So now we just put everything together. If we, if we define this by i, then so it's going to be 2 pi 0 so the integral from 0 to 2 pi of this okay so f of c of t is this so I can take the root 2 out So now all I need to do is integrate this. Fairly, fairly easy to integrate. You'll get something like this. Okay, so hopefully you can see now that the path integral, or the scalar line integral, is just a generalization of the integral that you already know. And the secret in the computation is to break it down to, a, to a, um, an integration that looks familiar, like this one. Okay? All right, questions so far? Okay. All right. Now, I guess it's natural to try to make or draw analogues between the integral that you know at school and this new path integral. For example, is there a fundamental theorem of calculus for these path integrals? And I guess the answer is, well, sometimes. Sometimes. Hmm. Let's look back to the previous example, just for a second. Now, the path in this particular example is a helix. And we actually, um, we start at the, at the point 1, 0, 0, and we go through um, to the point when t equals 2 pi. So uh, there's one complete revolution, right? In this case, this is, these are the same start point and end point as the previous problem, but we're taking a different curve. We, instead of going around a helix to get from that point to that point, we're going along a straight line curve. Yes, Alex. Um, why is that what the parameterization is? Yep. 
Well, it's just given. So, so think of this. So this is the given function. Okay? It's just a given function to integrate along, along a path with respect to the arc length. No, 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 we're not. No. If, if f was identically equal to 1, then geometrically, the path integral would measure the arc length of the curve C. You with me? Yeah. All right, good. Good, good, good. All right, so, so the big question here is, does this path integral depend on the path that you take between two points? And the answer is, in general, yes. Okay? All right. Again, we parameterize. Okay? So, our starting point is 1, 0, 0. Our finishing point is 1, 0, 2 pi. And we can use something like this. Oops, 1 minus t. Now, this actually simplifies quite nicely down to 1, 0, 2 pi t. Oh, yeah, you're right. Absolutely right. Who said that? Thank you. Okay. All right, so we need the derivative of C and we need its magnitude. So what do we get? We're going to get something like 2 pi, uh, 0, 0, 2 pi. And the magnitude, of course, then is 2 pi. Again, no T dependency. All right, so also see that F evaluated along C. So we go up here, we replace uh, X with 1, Y with 0, and Z with 2 pi T. Oops. All right, so we put the magnitude and F of C together and integrate them. So the integral i is going to be, what's it going to be? It's going to be 1 plus 2 pi t times 2 pi dt. So again, we've broken it down to an integral that we know we can easily evaluate. And if you work that integral out, you should get the following. Okay, so big deal. So what? It comes back to the question I posed before. Does a path integral, the value of a path integral, does it depend on the curve or the path? If you go between two points using different paths, will our two answers be different? And the answer is yes, in general. Okay, you can see... In this example, we're going from this point to this point using a straight line segment. In the previous example, we're also going between those two points, but we're using a helix. And the answer is different. All right, that's an important step, an important piece of information. Okay, well, what other properties can we uncover for these path integrals? If we have, for example, the case when one path goes here, another path goes here, can we add the two path integrals together to get the path integral over the whole, the whole um, curve? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Okay. So for this one, you would parameterize C1. So, 
So I'm going to use C1 and C2. Now, C2, what's that going to be? It's going to be something like, well, the X doesn't change, so that's going to be 1. And then you start up here, and I guess you can go down here. So I've chosen this one. Okay, again, you can get this just by using the, the um, algorithm or the little formula that I put up earlier for the straight line segment, segments between two points. Okay. Now let's look at the derivatives. C dash of uh, C one dash of one is just going to be one one. And C2 dash is going to be something like 0 minus 1. So both of these parameterizations are going to have derivatives where the magnitude is constant. All right. So let's evaluate F along both of those parameterizations, C1 and C2. So F along C1. Uh, it's going to be something like um, t plus t squared. F along C2 is going to be something like uh, 1 plus 1 minus t all squared. Oh. Oh. Okay. All right, so now we just put our parts together and add the two um, uh, path integrals together. Okay, so that's the path integral over the first line segment. And this is going to be the integral of the second line segment. Okay, so they're very simple integrals to, to calculate. If you work those out, you should get something like this. Okay, but you should check that. All right, so in general, the path matters that you're integrating over. The answer will depend on the path. Hmm, hmm, okay. All right, anyone still going on this one? No, okay. All right, let's look at some applications, because they matter. Why are, these, why are these path integrals physically significant? Well, one answer to that question is if we have a wire or a coil or a spring lying in three-dimensional space, and we would like to calculate the total mass of that wire, 
if we know the density at any point in the wire, then the total mass is equal to the path integral of the density function integrated over the, the curve or the path C. Okay? So it's analogous to the double and triple integrals that we looked at last lecture where you want to calculate, for example, the total mass of a plate, a two-dimensional plate. Okay. Now you can come up with this by, again, slicing and summing. All right? Now we can also calculate moments, centers of mass, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, for these springs or coils. In particular, path integrals provide a perfect, a perfect uh, means for, for uh, this type of study. There's a lot of formulas on this, but um, again, they're analogous to the double integral stuff that we talked about last lecture. Okay, so one important thing to remember here is that for these coils and wires, we use mass per unit length. To um, measure density. Okay, so let's do uh, let's do a, a, an example. It's a little something on the moment of inertia. Some more formulas, but I don't really want to talk about them at the moment. I, I want to actually calculate uh, a particular example. Okay, a wire. It sits in, in this case, the YZ plane. And we have the parameterization for our wire. So this little red curve represents our wire. Okay? And we're also given the density at any point along our wire. The question is, calculate the center of mass of our wire. Okay, now with these kinds of problems, symmetry is important. Okay? So, just to save ourselves some calculations, who can tell me what's the x component for the center of mass? Zero. Why? Yeah, well, because, because the wire essentially lies in the yz plane. Okay? So, So the important, the important thing here is that we can get some of these things very quickly. Okay, so for the other two, two um, coordinates, the Y bar and the Z bar, we'll need to do some calculations. So let's take our parameterization and differentiate it. Now here I've used J's and K's. I'm just going to write it as an ordered triple here. I hope you don't mind. So we want to work out the magnitude. So I square all the components, add them together, and take the square root. Should get something like this. Now note here we have the dependency on T. We haven't seen that before. It does actually make the integral harder in theory, but I think we're going to be okay with this one. Alright, so here's our density function. That plays the role of F. So we want to evaluate delta along our parameterization. So we go up here, replace 
y with t squared minus 1, there's no z or x component here, so uh, x uh, present there, so. So we're going to get 15 root t squared minus 1 in plus 2. Okay. So let's ca so to calculate the mass it's just the path integral of the given density function over the curve curly c. So in this case we go back to our parameterization there they are limits of integration. And we should get something like this. Now you can see in the integrand, the square root signs uh, cancel off quite nicely. So we're quite happy about that. So if you cancel these square root signs and integrate, you'll get 40. Okay, but you should check that. Okay, so we've calculated the mass. Now we calculate the relevant moments. Okay, so let's see if we can calculate the path integral here. Well, again, we replace y with it, with the corresponding parameterization component. Why? The delta, again, along C is 15 root t squared plus 1. And the magnitude of C dash is t root t squared plus 1. Again, we've got nice square root signs cancelling each other out. And we get down to something like this. Okay, so if you integrate this, you get minus 24. Okay, so now we can calculate, we have all the information needed to calculate the y component of the center of mass, y bar. Okay, so according to my calculations, the y component is minus 3 on 8. Okay? Three on eight. Oh, is it oh sorry? Three on five. What am I doing? It is an eight, but it should be a five. Alright? Thank you. Alright. So what about the z bar, the z component of center of mass? Well, you just go through and you calculate the moment that you want. And then divide by the mass. So I won't do all the calculations. Okay. I got 75.
Okay, now a good, a good check here is to go back and see if your center of max, mass is actually realistic. All right, if, you, if you go back with these coordinates and look at your curve, then it actually does, it does uh, seem to be realistic. All right, questions? Questions? Comments? Now, about a third of the way through this lecture, I, I posed a big question. Is there a fundamental theorem for path integrals? And I said, well, maybe. Definitely maybe. If you want something really interesting to work on, go away and try to see the conditions under which the fundamental theorem of calculus works for path integrals. Okay, I'll see you all tomorrow. <laughs>